everyone. It's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy. And in today's video, I actually want to share a clip from an interview that I did with Danielle Hayden for my Marketing Junkie podcast. Now, I don't usually share the clips from that particular podcast on this channel, but it's going to become very clear as you listen to this conversation why I felt like it was so important to share this interview on this channel. So Danielle Hayden is a corporate finance offer turned CEO of her accounting business called Kickstart Accounting. And in this conversation, we talk all things bookkeeping and small business accounting. And Danielle really shares a lot of the mistakes that a lot of small business owners, including indoor playground owners, make when they're setting their business up, when they're managing their finances and their books. And this conversation really goes deep into a lot of the topics that there's not a lot of discussion about. And something else that we talk about that is absolutely crucial for indoor playground owners to understand is the process of selling a business. So even if you have no intention right now of selling a business, or if you're still in the daydreaming phase, there are all sorts of life circumstances or things that can pop up that make selling a necessity or make selling a whole lot more attractive. So in my conversation with Danielle, we talk about key metrics that we need to be monitoring and reporting on in order to make your business sellable. She talks about things that buyers are going to be looking for. She's going to break down the entire selling and buying process and what happens in each of the phases. And she's also going to share what causes a lot of potential buyers to withdraw their offers on businesses really similar to play cafes or indoor playgrounds. So this is a conversation that I really want you to listen to in its entirety because Again, Danielle does such an amazing job of breaking down these really scary and unknown topics in a way that is really empowering. And I love how she described all of these concepts and how she gave us really specific action items. And she gives us an actual list of things that we should be doing every single month right now to move our business forward and also make it sellable in the future and really increase the value of your business so that you can have the highest possible return from that sale. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Danielle Hayden. And if you want to learn more about Danielle, all of her information is linked below this video in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe for more tips and more guest interviews and hit the like button if you find this conversation helpful. I know I sure did. Thank you so much for joining me today, Danielle. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me here. So let's get started by telling everyone listening a little bit about you and who you serve. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the founder of a company called Kickstart Accounting Inc. We provide really support to entrepreneurs in understanding their numbers. And the best way for us to do that is to help them have accurate and on-time bookkeeping. It sounds so simple, but it's... It, it is more unheard of in the industry than you think. So um, we provide that on-time and accurate bookkeeping for entrepreneurs with the goal of helping them be able to understand their numbers and be able to make better business decisions. Um, I am also a you know, mama of two um, you know, from the Midwest. And <clears throat> really, I feel so fortunate to be able to wake up every morning and get to have such an amazing impact on so many other business owners and, um, and other women who are, um, um, supporting the entrepreneurship world. Right. Um, I, th I think that that entrepreneurship is so special and we have an opportunity to really change the world. And I'm so grateful that I get to serve so many other people in their journey. Awesome. And I feel like a lot more people have gotten that entrepreneurial bug since the pandemic happened. Everyone's kind of thinking about ways they can earn money from home and ways they can start their own business. So I think this is, you know, um, you're in the perfect industry. So I'm hoping yeah. people can be impacted with your cause and with your message. So I know exactly what you mean when you say that, you know, understanding numbers is absolutely crucial to making better decisions in your business. So that's what I really want to kind of dive into today. So just to get started, what or really when should business owners start thinking about going from that DIY route and managing their own books to getting some help? Because like I was saying on our little chat before we started recording, it's 
tax time. And everybody is all of a sudden realizing that their DIY systems maybe could use some improvement and they might be looking to outsource. So when should business owners start thinking about that? So it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I, I get asked this a lot and I don't have a magic number, right? So there's no, once you hit six figures, you know, it, it has more to do with your mindset than it does having a specific dollar metric that I want you to hit before you ask for help. When we work with clients, uh, we always say, again, we don't care how big you are, how many employees you ha have. What we care about is that you have a growth mindset. You are ready to take your business to the next level. Um, you um, have an idea of what works and what doesn't work. You're bringing revenue into your business. You're ready to start looking at expenses. You're ready to stop wearing all the hats in your business. You know, and you and I, I mean, we, we know this, right? You cannot wear every single hat in your business and grow, right? So it's more about a mindset when you are ready for that growth, when you're ready uh, to take that on, that's the time where I say, take off the hats, right? Start stripping one hat at a time because you do not have to, and you cannot wear every single hat in your business and be successful. And so this is one area where you can very easily pull this hat off and be able to easily give it to somebody else. I always, I always make this joke, um, bookkeeping and accounting is like this little black rain cloud that follows you around everywhere you go, because you know, it's something that you have to do. You don't want to do it. And it just follows you around on this to-do list or in the back of your mind. And so it's removing that, that, that black cloud. And so I want people to do it as soon as they have shifted into the mindset that I'm ready to grow. And yeah, I made some pretty crucial mistakes my first couple of years in business when I was going the DIY route. So that image of like the dark cloud and the rain cloud really resonates with me because I remember how lost I felt in those first couple of years, especially when I went to file my taxes and especially when I went to start actually valuing my business and things like that. Yeah. I love that you just said the word value. So there's no shame in that. Um, a lot of people hold a lot of shame around money and it becomes this shame spiral, right? Like it's tax time. Well, I didn't take it. I didn't do it all year. And now I'm, I'm ashamed that I have it instead of just saying, okay, that's okay. I didn't do it all year. Right. And now I'm going to ask for help. So I'm going to ask somebody to go backwards in time, help me get previous years straightened out and move forward. And so I, I just wanted to say like, just don't bring the shame along with you because we all make mistakes our first few years. It's just how quickly we can learn from them and move on. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, after I filed my first, I think it was my first two tax returns. I very quickly was like, okay, this is a hat that I need to take off right now. And I'm my hope with this interview and with this conversation is that people will come to that realization before they make those crucial mistakes and before it becomes an absolute necessity. So hopefully this kind of gets the wheels turning. Yes. So a lot of people I notice get confused between bookkeeping, accounting, CPA, financial advisors, and they're not really sure how each of those roles fit into their business and what they actually need to hire. So can you just give a brief overview and talk about the difference between each of those roles? Yeah, it's really interesting. When I came from corporate, into the entrepreneurship world, I had no idea how many different things you could call each different role. <laughs> I had no idea. But depending on where you live in the country, uh, or what background you have, if you came from corporate or another type of background, um, you know, you have a different interpretation of, of, of each term. So again, um, if you're like, I feel lost in all these terms, it's okay. We all are a little bit. Um, I call it your, your, your money triangle. And what I want every entrepreneur to have is um, a strong, a strong individual in each of their, their money triangle corners. Um, first and foremost, you need to have a strong bookkeeper. So this is the person who's going to record all the income and expenses in your systems. They are going to help you throughout the year, understand your numbers. So your bookkeeper should not just be recording that information into an accounting system in which you never see or have access to. They should then turn around, give you reports, give you a summary, uh, and aid you in that analysis throughout the year. 
at the end of the year, you then need your tax accountant. So that's CPA, tax accountant. Um, those are the two big terms that I hear for that. Uh, but that is the person that you should um, have in your corner to file your year end taxes. But I want you to hear from them throughout the year or be able to have the ability to contact them. Um, we see so much more success in our business owners, our clients who are willing to have an uncomfortable conversation in July and January, right? Where they're willing to say, where's my business at right now? Um, how much do I need to have to save for taxes? Where do I see my business at the end of the year? Uh, let me start saving. Let me start making the right business decisions for the end of the year. So it's really important to have that person in, in your corner. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that your bookkeeper and your tax account should not be the same person. So I'm going to say it again, because this is a big, big, big confusion point for people. Your bookkeeper and your tax account should not be the same people. Uh, so many people come to us and say, I just want this under one roof. I don't want to have to talk to two people, but your finance, the finances of your business, it's your heart of your business. You, if you do not have money, if you do not have cash, you do not have a business, right? So it's so important. Uh, the finances of your business are so important. And so it's important for you to put the time and energy of having two individual people. And I believe that because we need to have a checks and balance internal controls. Um, we need to have two different people who say, whoa, whoa, you know, why are you being so conservative or why are you taking so much risk? Why are these not classified correctly? So you need to have that checks and balance. Um, at Kickstart Accounting, we have a tax partner and we're going through a lot of this right now where we are challenging each other and that's okay, right? We're asking each other, why are you handling it that way? And we're saying, why are you handling it that way? And it's a good conversation for us to have because uh, you never want your tax account making a decision for your bookkeeping that only impacts the tax return, right? It doesn't impact how you manage your finances and the same thing. So then your third person that I want you to have in your, your third uh, triangle corner is a financial advisor. And this is somebody who can bring in your business and your personal together, help you save for retirement, have insurance. So every business owner needs to have insurance um, to protect their, their business. Uh, um, so that financial advisor will help you put the whole picture together. Awesome. So something that I hear a lot of, and I was kind of prying inside of my membership to kind of get their questions and what they're currently concerned about with regards to their finances. And a lot of them said that they were worried that they weren't making enough money yet to engage a financial advisor. So I know you said that there's no magic number, but is there an income level or a point at which financial advisors typically start working with people? So um, if you go to a high net worth financial advisor, they're going to say, yeah, you need a million dollars, you know, hundred thousand dollars. We have a tax um, or I'm sorry, we have a financial advisor that we work with who is specifically for small businesses. And so finding the right person uh, to help serve your business is going to be really important. Um, I want you to start now, right? If you can get used to paying yourself as a business owner, if you can get used to saving for retirement, having your business properly insured, it is going to shift your mindset. It is going to make you feel like you are valuing yourself. It's going to make you feel like you are valuing your business. And, and therefore that's going to show up in your marketing. That's going to show up in your sales. It's going to show up in how you lead your team. So it's going to show up in every other place of your business. So it's never too early to, to start, um, to, to start finding that right partner. Awesome. So thank you so much for identifying those three key roles. I think it's, there's a lot of misconceptions, like you said, around when and who and things like that. So that gives me a lot of clarity. And I never would have considered having two different people or two different companies for bookkeeping and accounting. So that is a takeaway that I'm taking from this. Good, um, good. You mentioned, you mentioned that your bookkeeper and your accountant should be engaging with you, like you said, throughout the year and helping you come up with these reports and metrics that help you make better decisions. So I want to dive into that a little bit more. So what are some examples of those key financial metrics that we as business owners should be monitoring along with our bookkeeper? Yeah. So when we work with our clients, um, our clients get a series of reports uh, and then we pull out what we believe is important for that business owner in that month or that quarter. So there are a million and five key, key performance indicators that you can choose from. 
Um, and they can change and ebb and flow over time as well. So we pull uh, a few key reports and then we pull what's important. So some of those key reports are um, your profit and loss for the last 12 months. This is really important to look at the seasonality of your business, be prepared for future seasons. Uh, be prepared for future expenses that are that are coming uh, in in the next season of your business. Uh, we do the the profit and loss um, compared to prior year. This report is one of my most favorite reports because um, we have it gives an opportunity to really celebrate with our clients. So there's you know in entrepreneurship we're just go go go. We tend to skip over milestones like oh wait I grew my business by fifty percent. Let me hold on, let me, let me say cheers real quick before I move on to the next milestone. And so the profit and loss compared to prior period allows us the opportunity to be able to celebrate with our clients or determine what's not working. So what happened this year that we're not receiving the same results as we did for prior periods. And then also looking at spending trends. So um, what was your spending trend last year at this time versus where you're spending money today? And does that align with where your goals are and where they were? And so that, that is a really, really important report to be uh, looking at with your bookkeeper. Um, and then this, this one, I know I just said that one was my favorite report, but this one is also my favorite report. <laughs> I know I'm an account. Um, it's your income statement as a percentage of sales. And this can be really, really surprising for people uh, because when you look at, okay, you know, 20% of my revenue is going to subscriptions or 20% of my revenue is going to contractors. Does that align with my goals, right? Um, am I looking for a lifestyle business where I'm comfortable with more of my revenue going to contractors and employees because they're helping me serve my clients. Um, or right now I'm, I'm still one man show I'm doing everything. So yes, I look really profitable today. However, I don't have any contractors and I don't have any em employees right now. So that, that report will allow for deeper analysis of where's my business today, right? Like where am I comfortable with that? Where do I want my business to go now? How do I shift my spending so that it's aligned with my goals? And then the balance sheet. Uh, this is one I think entrepreneurs forget about. You need to review the balance sheet with your bookkeeper on a regular basis. This is going to show um, your assets and your liabilities. I know some accounting terms, but what your liabilities are, are the loans and credit cards that you owe money to other people. And Post pandemic, um, we are seeing more businesses than ever saddled with debt. And so yes, entrepreneurship has exploded, but so has debt. And so um, that's something that you need to be having a discussion with your, your bookkeeper um, on if you're um, starting to get too debt heavy um, and if there's a plan to repay that debt. Awesome. And something that we've seen a lot of, like you said, uh, really as a result of the pandemic and things like that, and all sorts of things is inflation. So I'm finding that a lot of the business owners that I work with are all of a sudden having to go and do exactly what you said and review some of their costs and where they're spending money because it's really changed. Like their business operations hasn't changed, but their costs have gone up. So that's been something that has been eye-opening this tax season, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and just from a cash planning perspective, you know, I think as small business owners, we were more sensitive to increasing prices for our customers. However, our costs were increasing, you know, things like even something small as shipping or uh, small packaging or just, just the small subscription. I just got an email from one of our favorite software providers that they're, they're like raising our fees by almost 50%. Those are big changes and, and it's a good reminder to us as small business owners that it's okay for us to raise our prices, right? Or to have that evaluation of, are we still hitting our profitability markers, right? Are we as profitable as we want to be, or do we need to start to make adjustments on our pricing? Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I completely get what you're saying when you talk about getting nervous to raise our prices and how sensitive we are to that. So I love the concept of looking at the numbers and kind of taking the emotion out of it because something I think that's what a lot of, especially women entrepreneurs struggle with is that emotional tie to prices and things like that. 
So something else that has kind of increased in popularity, especially in the industries that I work with after the pandemic has really been interest in pivoting or potentially selling a business or looking into getting investors and things like that. And I wanted to bring this up because you talked about a balance sheet. Now, just let me walk you through the scenario that I see 99 out of 100 times. It will be a brick and mortar business owner, let's say an indoor playground owner, because that's a big portion of my audience. And they'll say, somebody approached me with an offer, you know, out of the blue, or I, my son is sick, or I want to move locations and I've decided to sell my business. They immediately think that it is just, oh, you take out your credit card, you, there's a price, they pay it. And they have no idea what goes into the process. They have no idea how to value their business. They have no idea how long that it takes. And like I said, a lot of us struggle with maintaining all of these reports and our balance sheets and things like that. So again, there's a big misconception that once you get an offer or once you decide to sell your business, that you can just put it up like on eBay or something (laughs) and list it. So Can you talk us through maybe the beginning phases or some key things that you need to make sure that you're doing or maintaining, or at least understanding if selling is anywhere on your business horizon? Yeah. So the first, first thing I'll say from day one. So a lot of people don't think they'll ever want to sell their business and they end up wanting to sell it. Right. Um, Have good bookkeeping procedures today, right? From day one, as early as you possibly can. Um, You are not an expert at bookkeeping. Um, That's not why you went into into business. Make sure that you have the professionals around you to make sure that your bookkeeping is clean. The reason I think that that is the most important thing that you can do, that when you start to go through this process, so uh, somebody came and made you an offer, what they're going to want to see is your financial statements. They're going to want to look at your books. They're going to want to see where is your revenue coming from? How are you paying people? How much are you paying them? How profitable is your business, right? Um, so being able to have really good, really clean records is going to help expedite the process. So if you have those good, good records, you're going to go into what's called the due diligence process. So that investor, that, that buyer is going to come in and they're going to start asking you for a lot of, a lot of information, a lot of questions. Yes. Some, some pieces of it are going to be your marketing and your selling strategy. Then it'll be your bookkeeping and your numbers. Um, and then a lot of your contracts and leases and any future obligations that your business holds. So if you can keep those really clean and crisp, you're going to go through that due diligence um, with, I'm not going to call it ease, but more ease because <laughs> the due diligence process is never easy. It's always um, a big time suck and uh, very, and can be very difficult. However, I've worked with so many clients and so many business owners who have sold their businesses and it is, it can be one of the most exciting things that you ever go through, right? You built a business with with like your fingers, right? Like your hands, you built this business and, um, there was somebody out there who wanted to buy this creation that you put together. And so there's something really proud uh, about that moment. And it is, it is awful, right? I've, I've seen business owners start to go through the process where when they didn't have good clean books, the offers actually withdrew, you know, that they couldn't validate their income. If they couldn't validate their expenses or they didn't have bookkeeping at all, right? Those offers came back out because they needed to make sure that they were buying a business that was um, of the value that, that the owner declared. Yeah. And I think a lot of times too, what I've seen is if somebody doesn't have clean financial reports and records, either exactly what you said, the owner or the offer is withdrawn, but also the offer could be a very much low ball offer. Yeah. Right? It could be really deeply undervaluing the business simply because they didn't have clean records. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Yes, absolutely. You, it, you know, when you have your business value, so first of all, when you have your business valued, you have to have some numbers to be able to even have that valuation done. And so if you can't have that valuation done, the value that you're going to declare, 
you know, if you don't know your numbers, how do you even declare a value, right? Like how, how do you declare that? Uh, and how do they declare it? So you definitely could be leaving a lot of money on the table. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's a process that a lot of us are kind of maybe not finding ourselves in right now, but kind of contemplating and considering and exactly what you said, it's, it's, becoming very clear to them how important clean bookkeeping and record keeping is. And one question that I wanted to ask, because this is, I think, another misconception that a lot of my audience has is that all of this information can be pulled pretty easily retroactively. But it feels like if you are a couple years into your business and all of a sudden you decide you want to sell, it must be much harder to kind of analyze that type of thing and do those monthly reports and things like that retroactively, right? Yeah. So a few things in there, if you're going retroactively, you missed out on a huge opportunity because when, so for instance, when we send our clients, uh, their financials, we send them either weekly, monthly, or quarterly, they get reports. And so they are, they have the ability to make business decisions uh, tax decisions as they grow throughout the entire year. So you are missing out on a huge opportunity if you're not keeping current with those numbers and seeing them on a regular basis. So first and foremost, I don't want you to move out, lose out on that opportunity. Now to go retro, you can, uh, however, it's going to be more costly is going to take time, right? These things don't happen like that. <laughs> Trust me, my team and I are doing this all day, every day. Um, the, the catch up, we call it a catch up. So that catch up process, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And if you have several years worth of information, it will take a really long time. Um, it takes us about three weeks to do one year. So imagine if you have three, four years worth of data that you're inputting into, into QuickBooks. The other piece of that is if you're going retro more than one year, how did you file your tax return? Right. And so when they go through that due diligence process, they're going to say, well, I want to see your tax return and your books. And they're going to want to see your books match your taxes. And so this is really something that you need to have current on a year to year basis. And even if you're just going back that one year, again, you've lost out on the opportunity to look at those numbers all throughout the year. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of us are kind of missing out on. We all file our taxes, but we don't have that matching consistency with the books. And I think that is a big shock to people when they go to start thinking about selling their business or when they meet with a business broker for the first time. And one of the things I really hope people take away from this conversation is that it is very difficult, like you said, to do this retroactively. And it could really cost you not only time and money, but it could cost you an offer. Like if somebody is looking for an investment or a business opportunity and it takes you three months to value your business. They're not going to wait around. A new opportunity, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, just the way it works out in my experience, especially within the last couple of years, when somebody decides to sell their business, it's usually for a reason. So either, like I said, somebody is ill or somebody gets, you know, has an unexpected pregnancy or somebody is moving or something like that. It's all very um, tied to a specific timeline. So they need to sell and they need to sell quickly. So unfortunately, again, I want people to really understand how long it can take to catch up if you are not putting all of this into practice right now and how that can really impact your ability to not only get a profit from the sale, but make a sale at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because you know, a lot of us, when we go into entrepreneurship, you're not thinking about the end first, right? Like you're not thinking about the end game. You're thinking about how do I get through this year? How do I get through this month? Right. How do I, how do I create the profitable business right now, right today? And I think it, you know, we all talk about goal setting and, um, you know, the number one way of, of goal setting is to think about the end in mind. Don't let, um, these things come as a surprise to you later on. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you're, you're asking these questions and having this conversation for, for your audience. Yeah. And I always say, you know, when I talk about exit strategy and selling and things like that, it's kind of like talking about, you know, divorce before you get married but yeah. it's so necessary and you just never know what's going to happen. There could be 
you know, we always as business owners talk about like the hypothetical milk truck scenario, right? Like anything can happen to us or any of our key employees or any aspect of our business at any given time. So I really just want people to understand that being prepared can never hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that, you know, you're not a business broker necessarily, but from a financial perspective, what are some of the things that you see in your experience that makes a business sellable? So what are those potential buyers looking for in those financial reports? Yeah. So a few things, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the debt ratio. Um, so if your business is saddled with debt, um, when they come in for, and do the due diligence process, uh, the investor is going to want to know why, right? Is it because you're not running a profitable business? Uh, it was this poor use of startup funds. You know, why, why are you not generating enough cash to have a healthy, sustainable business? So I think you're, um, paying very close attention to how much debt you're taking on in your business is really important as you start to think about um, selling your business or as you're running your business, right? So every time you need to go take on debt, what is the plan to pay that debt back? Why do I need it? So what, what am I doing today that's causing me not to have the cash flow to be able to reinvest in my business and continue to grow organically. And so I think it's really important for us to look at that every time we go to take on more, more debt. And this can be as simple as a credit card, right? So I'm not talking about the next line of credit or huge investment. This can just be not paying off your credit card month over month. So um, your cash, cash is king, cash is queen. Um, we need to make sure that we have enough cash in the bank. Um, the other uh, piece of this that is going to make uh, a business very sellable is um, looking at the customer base. So do we have, um, long-term relationships with, with customers? Um, are they coming back to repurchase from you? Uh, and are, do they have the relationship with you, the business owner, or do they have the relationship with the brand? So, um, I read a book called built to sell. I don't know. It's probably like five, six years ago now. And it really transformed the way I ran my business and the way I, I advise other people to run their business. If you are the person who is touching every customer, every service, every product, you are not sellable, right? When, when the business sells, you are no longer going to be there. And so you want to have yourself removed in a way that's healthy for your business today. And so if you're the one doing everything today, it's okay. It's all right. I want you to start thinking about how do you do things? And I want you to start to create standard operating procedures so that somebody else can come in and do things just as good as you, maybe even better than you, right? Because they're following your standard operating procedures, because what becomes sellable is the way you do things, the standard operating procedures, the brand that's created. Um, so I think that's really, a, that's a really, really important piece. And then, um, I personal and business expenses, guys, you have to hit, keep those separate. Um, if you are, um, not taking home a profit and you start to dig in with your bookkeeper, it's because every time you take your family out to eat, the business is paying for it. Is that that's not a good use of, of, of funds. So, um, if you do not look profitable on paper, the value of your business is going to decline. And what we see with our clients is that that generally means that there's a lot of commingling going on. I would rather you take home a bigger paycheck and a bigger owner's draw and keep them separate. That's really interesting. I never really thought about it that way, that it could hurt not only your current booking being, but also the future value of your business. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I love talking about standard operating procedures. That's one of my favorite topics. So I cover it a lot. So I'm not going to get too far into it, but I'm so glad that you brought it into this conversation. So a lot of us are already operating our businesses, but a lot of my audience is also kind of in the beginning phases of launching their business and building a brand. So do you have any tips for somebody who is just in the beginning phases, just forming the foundation of their business to really set their business up for success to potentially be able to sell one day. I know you mentioned, you know, 
your role, your specific role in the brand and how to potentially remove yourself from that in a healthy way, like you said. Is there anything that we can do, anything we should keep in mind, like I said, at the very beginning to set ourselves up for future success? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about the uh, accounting piece. So as early as possible, get the right systems in place. That does not include a Google spreadsheet. So make sure you have QuickBooks, zero, uh, make sure you have an accounting system in place. Um, and then you know, ask for help uh, as soon as possible. So I've learned this in my business. I've seen so many of our uh, clients go through this process. Asking for help is okay, right? And um, sometimes we're not sure if we can afford it until we can afford it. And then by the time we can afford it, we're, drown we're drowning. Um, so it's having a team behind you that can help you plan for things like, when should I hire again, right? Um, what is gonna be the cost of, of hiring again? And how many people do I need on my, on my team? How much should I be paying myself? So just asking for help, I think is the number one mistake I can, I can encourage you to avoid is, is, you know, putting your head in the sand and saying, I can do everything myself. I don't need to hire. I don't need to get the experts. You do not have to wear every hat to be successful. I said at the beginning, in fact, if you can take off a few hats, I promise you, you'll be more successful. And so I think that this is the biggest thing that I could encourage uh, business owners to do as early as possible. Thank you so much. I love those tips. So kind of getting back into the selling process, again, just even if selling is not on your horizon or in your plans, are there any things that we should avoid in the selling process or maybe red flags or anything that we should look out for as business owners? So there are scams. Um, you know, we have a client who we're working with right now um, who, who went through, um, is still going through a, a pretty, pretty dark phase right now because they had uh, somebody who was looking at purchasing their business. Um, they paid some, some money, uh, to, to that person in order to go through this process. Um, they agreed to do some work for free, uh, and ended up, um, you know, in the end, you know, that person wasn't looking to purchase that business or they were looking to get something for free. Um, so generally if somebody's coming in to invest or purchase your business, uh, they're not asking for money up front. Uh, you should be going through the due diligence process first. Uh, once there's a letter of intent um, and the deal has been closed, that's when there should be a transfer of, of funds. And then um, again, ask for help. Make sure you have the right team, team in place. You are going to need an attorney. This is not something that you should be doing on your own. Um, so you need to have the right accounting team behind you to help be able to supply the accounting documents. And then you'll need to have a strong accounting or strong legal team behind you to help you with the legal side. Um, so I think my, my biggest tip there would just be to watch for scams. And I don't want you to tread so cautiously that you don't take the opportunity, uh, but I want you to do your homework and make sure that the, that the offer and the people are legit. Yeah. And unfortunately I have seen very similar things happen, but more so by accident. So the person wasn't intending to scam or anything like that, but there's a really common scenario where somebody thinks that they're interested in purchasing a business, but they're really inexperienced and really have no idea what goes into it or how much it could potentially be. So they'll engage with a business owner. Again, let's say an indoor playground owner, hypothetically, they'll say, I'm interested in purchasing your business. And then that current owner will pour, you know, dozens of hours and all this time and effort into educating this person about their business and giving away all of this, you know, all of these company secrets and things like that. And I've seen those people never make an offer, but instead just open up their own business. And well, there should be an agreement before you go through that process. So do not ever disclose a word about your business without a confidentiality agreement and a non-compete. Uh, so I think that would prevent that from, from happening. Um, and, and start to think about, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about selling your business today, you can start to put together the documents, right? So 
what are my, what are my contracts? Let me save those in a folder. What are my financials tax returns? Let me save those in a folder. You can even put together a sales and marketing deck, right? So that it, it, it walks through somebody, what the brand is, the history of the business, and then where you see the business going. And that becomes your, your deck for when you, when you have a, a potential buyer coming in. Um, but just, I want to reiterate, you do, you know, do not give away anything about your business until you have, um, your attorney review the nine compete and confidentiality agreements. Yeah, that's a good point because a lot of brick and mortar business owners will supplement their income, not even just, you know, with the scenario that I talked about where somebody is intending to buy and then never do and end up opening a copycat. A lot of business owners will do consulting to supplement their income. And they forget those important steps. So I'm glad that you brought that up because it's really common for people to forget things like that. And then that person, again, will end up using those secrets and all of that knowledge to mm. just open up their own business. And a lot of times people will be dishonest about where they're located or what their intentions are. So the whole process is just can be messy. So I'm glad that you brought up all of those legal things that need to happen. Yeah. So now that we're sort of wrapping up, I know we're approaching tax season, financials and things like that are kind of at the top of all of our minds. So do you have any other tips that you wanted to kind of leave us with or anything that we haven't talked about yet? So I know that the money side of your business can be scary and daunting. Uh, again, a lot of us can hold shame and thinking, oh my gosh, this is easy for everybody else. Why is this money side? Why is this number side so hard for me? It's hard for everybody, right? Like that it's not just you. Um, and again, shame will be the quickest way to get yourself from not getting the help that you need. Um, and so if you're somebody who either has been doing DIY, um, or you're scared to even look at the numbers or approaching the, the topic, just know that you're not alone. Uh, keep on doing the things that you're doing, like listening to this podcast and tuning into subjects that are difficult, right? I know that tuning into this is, is not easy for everybody. Um, so keep on doing the hard things, keep on doing the, the uncomfortable things because each uncomfortable thing uh, is going to lead you to more success in your business and, and, your, and, and in your life. I love that. That was a perfect note to end on because something that I really wanted people to focus on this year and when I was doing my planning for this year, I really wanted to focus on implementation. A lot of us consume a lot of content. A lot <laughs> of us um, are just fine, you know, learning about marketing or fun things like Facebook ads or something like that. But a lot of us kind of avoid those tough topics and not just avoid learning about them, but avoid implementing them. But I love what you said about doing the difficult work and how it can lead us to where we ultimately want to be. Yeah. Entrepreneurs love to buy all the courses and, and consume all the information, which I appreciate, right? I'm an avid book reader. You can't see it, but I have a bookshelf right here with a million books. However, if I realize that I am only consuming and not doing, um, that, that I have to check myself, right? It's having a real conversation with ourselves. So um, after this episode, hopefully you can take one thing that we talked about, right? Just, just one, right? And then maybe tag this episode to come back to in another month and you can do just one and do that one thing um, that's going to feel uncomfortable, but that's going to move your business forward. That's going to move your financial position forward. Yeah. So speaking of, where can we learn more about you and your business? Yeah. Uh, Kickstartaccountinginc.com is our website. Uh, we have a, a five-day video boot camp that you can find there as well. Uh, walks you through each part of this, this very scary, confusing accounting process. Um, and then we are doing all kinds of fun uh, reels and all kinds of fun stuff on Instagram. Uh, so you can follow us at Kickstart Accounting. And uh, if you are struggling with your money mindset, uh, we have a podcast, Entrepreneur Money Stories, uh, where we're sharing entrepreneur stories about uh, strengthening our money mindset and digging deeper into some of these topics. So I'd love for you to tune into that as well. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. I will link all of that information in the show notes so that everybody can very easily navigate to all those places. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. And it is one of those topics that you should not put on the back burner. So 
if you have a list of things that you're waiting to implement, try and move this one up to the top because it's really important. Amen. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. That wraps up my conversation with Danielle. I hope you found it as valuable and as helpful and actionable as I did. So as I said in the beginning of this video, all of Danielle's information is linked in the episode description. And I really just want to encourage you, like I said in the interview, to make accounting and bookkeeping and asking for help a priority because we never know what is going to come up in our lives that might potentially make selling our business necessary. So I hope you found this conversation helpful. And again, if you found this video helpful, leave a like and subscribe to this channel so you never miss a tip. Thanks, guys. Thank you.